Hello, my name is Stuart Holliday, the president of Meridian International Center. Welcome to all of our viewers. Uh, I'm here with Ambassador Lori Fulton. Lori, welcome. Thank you. Uh, we are here at Meridian International Center, which is uh, one of Washington's uh, leading diplomatic and, and global leadership hubs to talk a little bit about uh, women's issues and Lori's career, Ambassador Fulton's career, in advance of International Women's Day. Uh, today's discussion is a partnership between uh, Meridian, uh, the Council of American Ambassadors, which is a uh, not-for-profit organization, really a coalition of, of former U.S. ambassadors uh, who have served uh, from the political ranks, uh, Republicans, Democrats, all around the world, uh, as well as the Diplomatic Courier, a leading publication dedicated to issues of diplomacy. You have had a distinguished career in, in the law. Uh, you have uh, run non-governmental organizations like Peace Links, um, and you've been a, a U.S. ambassador to a key ally to Denmark uh, at, uh, at a very pivotal moment. Uh, why don't you share with us a little bit, especially for those that are joining us from the Council of American Ambassadors, a little bit about how you got to be an ambassador and a little bit about the, the role that you played there in Copenhagen. You know, it was an amazing experience, as you can appreciate, Stuart, having the opportunity to be United States Ambassador to Denmark from 2009 to 2013, not only because Denmark is literally one of our top allies, depending on which government agency you talk to, it's frequently ranked in the top five. And so I grew up feeling this very close connection to Denmark. I had been in Denmark several times. And this times. was in the Midwest where you grew up? I grew up in South Dakota. Okay. I call that the heartland the of heartland. Scandinavian America. Right. <laughs> so it was an amazing opportunity for me. And how did I get there? I think that's hard to know specifically, um, except that I grew up in a family that was very oriented to community service, to government service, to electoral politics. And actually, that probably came from my Danish family. Is that right? My great-grandfather, who was a small landowner, was a member of parliament in Denmark. So I grew up thinking that you know public service is an honorable profession. And even if it wasn't my full-time profession, I almost always engaged in public service one way or another. And I'm imagining as a lawyer uh, at Williams and Connolly, you had to negotiate a lot. You had uh, plenty of, of dealings with uh, trying to advocate for your, the interests of your clients. So how, how is that similar uh, to being an ambassador in terms of your legal preparation? It was interesting, as the U.S. ambassador in Denmark, I had one client, one client. It was the United States of America, and everything I did was on behalf of that client. Mm -hmm. And as a lawyer, that's, you know, it's, it's like a way of looking at things. And it was very helpful, whether I was doing public diplomacy and outreach and answering questions about U.S. policy, or whether I was, as I was sometimes, negotiating tough issues. Uh, with the Danes, it was, it was a, for me, I think, a very important way to look at things. As a lawyer, I'm a litigator, and as a litigator, you need to understand the, your opponent's view and their case, and what do they really want, mm -hmm. particularly if you're trying to negotiate something. That's right. Because we often think that negotiation is head-to-head, -head, and it is, and that's your it's often helped with a face-to-face -face dialogue. We've just seen this with mm -hmm. our Cuba um, uh, relationship. But often it's not that the uh, desires of both parties are in total opposition. Sometimes they're more like this. Anyway, it was, I thought it was very effective for me um, to have the legal skills and outlook uh, as I represented the United States and Denmark at a, at a critical time. Fogh Rasmussen, who's the current Secretary General of NATO, was actually a, came through our Meridian uh, State Department leadership program, and um, he has uh, he served as Prime Minister, I believe, and then Secretary General. But uh, Denmark really plays a very significant role in, in NATO, and, and really 
as a close ally of the United States. I was wondering if you could talk about why that is and their partnership with us in, in NATO. You know, Denmark <clears throat> has played an extraordinary role in NATO, particularly, I would say, in the last decade, and the last maybe 15 years. And Anders Fogh may be one of the reasons for that. Uh, he was prime minister at the time. But even prior to his serving as prime minister, the previous government, which was a coalition of different parties than his, supported the United States' effort in Afghanistan. And that, for, the, for Denmark, who had been part of the UN coalition in Kosovo, was, was kind of a, a new step. It was a step out of, out of what they yeah. traditionally had been doing. And they, were, they are tremendous partners in NATO. So they were supporting our efforts in Afghanistan. They supported our efforts in Iraq. While I was there, one of the things I wanted to do was to be sure that <clears throat> Denmark knew how much we appreciated that. And they began something that's like a Veterans Day, the first time they've ever had this, because they haven't really had veterans. Mm -hmm. And they were, they were um, uh, starting this Veterans Day, which they call Flag Flying Day. And I remember attending and visiting with some of the Danish veterans afterwards and asking them where they served. Many of them had served in Afghanistan or Iraq. I thanked them for their service. And with that exception, the soldier, whether male or female, said back to me, we're so thankful for everything the United States has done. Thank you for everything you do. It was so moving. But I think that there is a, there is a close relationship between Denmark and the United States, as well as between Denmark and NATO. President Obama said about the Danes many times, they punch above their weight. Mm -hmm. They weren't always thrilled with that topic because they didn't want to look like they were doing more. Right. They were just doing what everybody should right. be doing. Um, but they have been terrific allies and terrific members of NATO, mm -hmm. including more recently when they have <clears throat> started efforts to be sure that the NATO countries were continuing to support Afghanistan even after the troops leave. Mm -hmm. They've been terrific. And one of the particular issues that you cared about and still care about a lot is, is the role that women can play in peace and security. And I know that, that uh, when you were in, in Copenhagen, you took uh, you know, a special interest in that topic and tried to advance the visibility and the awareness of the topic. I was wondering if you could kind of frame the issue up for us a little bit. What, what do we mean when we're talking about women in peace and security? Now, this has been a, a passion of mine for about three decades, maybe more, who's counting? that it's important for everybody to understand, particularly people in this country, to understand how important it is to have women be able to be engaged in their own communities around the world if we're going to have prosperity and global security. The nice thing about going to Denmark is I'm going to a like-minded country. So before I left this country, to be, become ambassador in Denmark, but after I'd been confirmed. I met with uh, former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, among others, and I said, you know, Madeleine, I've got this idea, I've got an idea to host a conference in Denmark about the role of women in global security. And she encouraged me. She said, that's a fabulous idea. Too good for it to be just bilateral. Mm -hmm. Make it Scandinavian U.S. Even better, make it Nordic Baltic U.S. And we did. Denmark co-hosted. Um, with the U.S. Embassy, a conference on the role of women in global security in October 2010. It happened to be on the 10th anniversary of UN Resolution 1325, which is sort of known as the Women in mm -hmm. Peacekeeping uh, Resolution. And this was an if you build it, they will come. I'm, this is not the United States government idea, it's my idea. I'm working with the Danes, the Danes mm -hmm. think it's a good idea. I'm working with all of my U.S. ambassador colleagues in the Nordic Baltic countries, but I'm also working with my colleagues in the diplomatic corps from those countries. But all of a sudden, everybody wants to come. Mm -hmm. So we have so many speakers from the U.N., from the E.U., and our first keynote speaker was then Secretary General Anders Fogh Rasmussen. I see, yeah. uh, Hillary Clinton participated by video, we had, we had ministers, and um, from each of the countries, uh, the Nordic Baltic, but we focused on three countries emerging from conflict, Afghanistan, Liberia, and Uganda. Mm -hmm. This is in 2010. The 
point of the, co the conference was what do we, as like-minded countries, do effectively to help women become more involved in their own communities. So we had people with on-the-ground experience and people from those countries with lived-through experience. So the idea was to come up with best practices. And um, Secretary General Rasmussen told me uh, that as a result of that conference, one of the many deliverables was that NATO um, has a position um, for, it's a, it's a uh, special representative for U, UN 1325, mm -hmm. um, and that the Norwegians sponsored that position. Uh, the first person to hold that position was a Norwegian, and they did it as a result of my conference. Oh, great. And that as a result great. of that position, NATO also started to, I think it's called, you know, mainline, mainstream, the effect of women on women for every one of their programs. Mm -hmm. So, that's huge! Well, we all know that women uh, are absolutely an essential part of creating economies, institutions, uh, family cohesion, ideas, entrepreneurship. And, you know, one of the challenges we face today is, is how do we put that 1325 into effect constantly, and how do we institutionalize these things so they become just part of our peacekeeping and peace building policies? Um, do you think we've made progress? Uh, obviously, we've got a, a road to go, but uh, you know, where are we on, on on the scale? Do you think of of, of really making? women a central part of, of peace building? I think we've made a lot of progress. You know, one of the issues is you can look back to Liberia and when they ousted Charles Taylor and the important role of, of the women in white, as they were called then, who stood in sort of silent protest along the sides of the road. But when finally he was um, captured and people were trying to have their negotiations about what to do with him, women were not at the table. Mm -hmm. They were not part of that, and it was a very difficult time, and the men were starting to disperse. The women in white formed a like chain around the building where the negotiations were, and they said, you're not leaving here until you solve this. You know, we need to find ways to get more women at the table, but I think we're making progress. I mean, here at Meridian, with mm -hmm. particularly the International Visitors Leadership Program, and I participated you know, a couple months ago when we had women members of parliament from some of the North African and Middle Eastern countries. And they're there as members of their parliament because there are new constitutions in the countries usually that require a certain amount of participation right. by right. women. And, you know, I asked them about the quotas. What do you think about the quotas? This was surprising. I remember this and, answer. And yes, because they did all answer it because I yeah. said, I really want to know. And they said, we wish we didn't need the quotas, but if we didn't have the quotas, we wouldn't be here. Right. So I think we're taking important first steps to get women at the table. And they, they also said something interesting about the quotas, which is that people were using the quotas as an excuse, right, to fulfill their obligation yeah. to have their women's uh, participation. But really, when it came to the decision making and the, the, the you know the, do the the room where the decisions were being made, that they weren't present. So. There's still a big issue that quotas can't uh, deal, can't solve. There is the fact that you have a certain percentage of women in parliament doesn't mean they're on the key committees, or the chair of the key committees, or that they're participants in the discussion. But it's a start. I was wondering if you could talk about uh, a little bit how Dane see the United States. What are some of the challenges with being the ambassador from the United States in terms of obviously people have strong feelings about the United States because we're a major world power, and, uh, but we're also an ally. So how did that play out and how did you try to move the needle in terms of the, the public opinion in Denmark? I thought that one of my most important roles as the United States ambassador was public diplomacy. It was out outreach to Danes around the country, not just the ministers and the government officials in Copenhagen. Part of it is also constantly reaching out to the next generation. 
So I tried to gear my public diplomacy as much as possible to younger generations. So I spoke at high schools, I spoke at uh, trade school, vocational schools, I spoke at colleges, and uh, I spoke in English, always, uh, so they had to ask their questions in English. But I thought it was a very important thing to do. One of the other things I did was I took the embassy out of Copenhagen one day. I took it two hours away to Vila, where so we could drive it over there two hours, and, and Vila's in mid-Jutland. Jutland is the peninsula that comes up from Germany. It was a fabulous, uh, more than so I anticipated. that was going south for you, right? It was, for us, it was pretty much going um, west. Yeah. But to the, heart of the, so, yes. to the heart of the country. Yes. And, and the, it was a very important thing to have done because it, sh it, it just made that whole peninsula, uh, which is where most of the Danes live, feel like you know, the U.S. Embassy cared about them. Because what do you mean by us. taking the embassy there? Well, we, we planned this ahead of time. We picked out the site. I'd send some of my you know, young Foreign Service officers over there to work with the mayor. And uh, we had representatives from our um, you know, commercial section, mm -hmm. from our political section. Of course, our counselor officer went over there, so anybody mm -hmm. who had visa issues you know, we could deal with. Oh, we see. took the public uh, affairs section. Um, I did meetings. We had, I did an open public meeting. Then we had a roundtable with businesses. Right. We had a Facebook meeting with young people after school got out. It was just we had the, you know, did events any, constantly. Did any other, have you ever heard of another embassy doing this? No. Is this, this, this is something that sounds <laughs> to me like the State Department should take note of. I wanted to ask you one last public diplomacy question. Um, as you know, we work a lot with the International Visitor Leadership Program here. I was wondering if you could comment on uh, the value that you see in you know, having emerging leaders come and sort of see America firsthand, but really kind of get out beyond Washington and engage the community, and do you think that's still a, a, an important program? IVLP, International Visitors Leadership Program, in my view, is one of the most important programs the Department of State has, even for our good allies like Denmark because it gives them an opportunity, gives these young leaders, and there have been fabulous people who've been sure. chosen for this program. It gives young leaders the opportunity to come to the United States, not just as a tourist, but to have some meetings and some programs set up, and it gives them an opportunity not just to come to Washington and New York, but to go other places, to go to Utah, to go to Colorado, to go to Minnesota. I mean, it's fabulous. I think it is so important. And the repercussions from that are long-lasting. Mm -hmm. There were a number of parliamentarians and ministers in Denmark who have either been on an IVLP program or perhaps a German Marshall mm -hmm. Fund or program. Or, or, yeah. Yes, yeah. and it's fabulous, and I think it's so important. Of course it's important to countries where there are more emerging democracies, mm -hmm. but it's just as important for those countries that we want to continue to be our stalwart allies for 20 years. We need them to know us. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Fulton, and we'd like to thank you for joining us. Um, on behalf of Meridian International Center, the Council of American Ambassadors, and uh, the Diplomatic Courier, uh, we, we hope you'll join us again. We will continue to focus uh, on women in the lead-up to International Women's Day. Thank you.